Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So today we're going to discuss, you didn't have a real stroke. <clears throat> so I've seen this on the Facebook, on some of the stroke groups I belong to. Uh, and I've done a couple videos on stroke is an orphan disease and stroke is invisible. Uh, I believe it was eye, eyes for invisible. So we're going to just discuss, you didn't have a real stroke. So I'm going to say a few things during the course of this video that might sound insensitive and they don't intend, uh, there's no intention to be that way. So for those of us that have had a, a stroke, be it moderate, be it major, be it minor, and we've had a fairly short-lived recovery or a fairly effective recovery, you're going to have people in your world try to tell you you didn't have a real stroke because you didn't have no one right? And that's not to belittle, berate, demean anyone. Because I've seen someone end up like that, and that person was my grandmother. Her and I had probably the exact same stroke. Uh, in fact, I had my stroke on what would have been her birthday if she was still alive. So, um, she had a stroke that was left brain, was probably also parietal lobe like mine, um, and she was debilitated. She was bedridden. She was really good for about three words, yes, no, and shit. Um, she had extreme difficulty moving her arms, uh, both of them, you know, she ended up in the worst case scenario. My advantage was I had my stroke in front of people at work. People watched me go down. My advantage was I went from my workplace to the neuro nearest, nearest neuro trauma center on a neuro redirect in province of Ontario. If you know, on a C test two. Um, light sirens down the highway, like 100, 100 clicks an hour, 120 clicks an hour, bang, done. Um, my advantage was the neurologist just happened to be tripping through emergency. My advantage was I was diagnosed and be started my treatment probably within 90 minutes of having my stroke. Right? That's my advantage. Her disadvantage was she was an elderly lady, 84. She lived alone. She had her stroke. No one knew when she went down. So the doctors at that point can't ethically. Hey, Crash, how's it going, buddy? We've been joined by Crash the Wonderbird, everyone. Hey, buddy, what's going on? So she didn't have the advantage of getting the TPA. She lasted about another two years. She went from a... No, she did. Yeah, she lasted about two years. She, um, she went from a hospital up and Crash has departed. So she went from a hospital uh, to a long-term nursing care facility where she had another stroke and that eventually then killed her. So I've seen a real stroke. Uh, the last job I had in mental health was working with acquired and traumatic brain injury patients. I was a rehab and therapy support worker. I worked under the direction of physiotherapists, uh, occupational therapists, neurologists, psychologists, doing many things with many clients, taking them into the community, making sure they're activated, um, assisting them with rehab goals, doing various things. So I'm very, very familiar with high functioning, low functioning persons after having some form of neurological disease or deficit or, or injury. So, and I know, I know there are people out there that a brother, sister, husband, wife, child, grandparent, someone close to you, or even a very close friend, is going to look at you like, hey, you didn't have a real stroke. Well, they had a real neurologist. Mm -hmm. They had a real doctor tell them they had a real stroke. They were given a pile of real medication. So who are you to judge how real their stroke is or not? Right? Who are you to judge what their deficits are? Because, and I'm going to use me as an example. So before my stroke and after my stroke. Those worlds, depending on the day, depending on the situation, depending where I am, they're almost identical. Almost. Before my stroke, I could walk into a noisy mall, no problem at all. I could walk around, do what I needed to get done, scurry through all the peoples, walk into all the stores, buy all the things, and there's Crash again. Hey, buddy. What are you doing, my friend? You gonna back your stay? Okay, maybe not. So I could walk through all the stores, I could go visit all the people, I could do all the shopping, and I could take three to four hours to do it. He's in a mood tonight. Don't know why. So, and I could do all that shopping, no problem at all. Now, if I go into a mall, 
Maybe I'm good for an hour and a half. Maybe. I'm taking sunglasses, which I never needed before. Um, I would wear earbuds, listening to something on my mobile phone, be it a podcast or a YouTube video or something, like something to block out the ambient noise. Um, I, 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 I fucking hate crowds. Um, <clears throat> so there's one example where you might not be able to tell on, on just a normal day in day out basis. If I'm at home having a stroke, I have days that are so remarkably close before my stroke to after my stroke. I, I wish I could have those days every day. Then there are other days where the difference between my pre-stroke world and my post-stroke world is larger than the Grand Canyon in any direction. Um, I have days where I'm extremely fatigued for no reason at all. I have days where the day starts out okay, but quickly circles the toilet, and then I'm in bed for the rest of the day for whatever reason. So, and, I, and I'll admit, I'm, I'm a very lucky individual. Um, I'm an extremely lucky individual. I was diagnosed within, you know, a ridiculous quick period of time after my stroke. <clears throat> People watch me go down. I had the drug that saved my life within, I'm going to guess, 90 minutes. You know, um, I got the best possible care right after my stroke. <clears throat> In the hospital, when they put me on the cardiac and renal uh, monitoring unit because they wanted to check my ticker. Um, I was too scared to sleep that night. I was just too extremely scared to sleep that night. So I did a lot of pacing. Well, more moving a foot and sort of shuffle dragging a foot and moving a foot, shuffle dragging a foot. It was more, more of that. Um, so I can appreciate when people say that you didn't have a real stroke and you have no idea how demoralizing, debilitating, damaging, and discriminatory such a simple statement can be, right? Because you're now invalidating that person's entire stroke experience. You're basically telling that individual that you do not have <clears throat> the intellectual acumen, the emotional capability, or even a small scintilla of empathy to try to even remotely understand what that person may have to go through. And I'll be honest, I have days where I'm in the community, like in a store, for example, and I'm having a bit of a rough patch. And it's just easier for me to explain to someone that I've had a stroke than try to explain what foot drop is, or aphasia, or anomia, or apraxia, or why I'm wearing a sunglasses indoors, you know, at 9.30 at night, why I'm wearing sunglasses in the middle of the winter in Canada, 9.30 at night in a store. It's just, it's, then people still don't get it. That's really nothing you can do about that. If they don't get it, they don't get it. But if you were someone that, that I trust and I considered you a friend and you were to come up to me and you were to try to do the whole, hey, you didn't have a real stroke. Well, I'm immediately just going to disown you. That's just that simple. Like you've then proven yourself incompetent to me and, and I don't have the time to deal with bullshit anymore. That's just part of my new normal. I don't deal with bullshit. So, for those of you that have had a stroke, or a traumatic or acquired brain injury, some other form of deficit, where you're, you're being tried to be told it's not a real injury, there are far worse off people. Yeah, there are for far worse off people. Mm -hmm. You know what? Some days I feel just a little bit guilty. Because I know... That right now, I'm a very small percentage of the post-stroke population. So I'm under 50, for one. I survived a stroke. Uh, I'm back to work. I've been back to work for almost six months now. I'm performing fairly well at work. I still have rough days. you know. And I know there are people that are been six, seven months post-stroke or longer. That might still be in hospital. I know there are people that are two or three years post-stroke that still can't walk right. I know there are people that are six or seven weeks post-stroke, they're still in a wheelchair. I know I'm lucky. And, and I try to embrace the fact that I got some of the best possible health care, some of the best possible intervention, as fast as possibly could be. And it's given me right now the best possible outcome. 
and I'm, I'm lucky. And I, I completely and totally admit that I'm lucky. And I've got some really good friends um, and family members that have been there, you know, and been supportive. And, and thank you to you people. I don't have permission to use your names on the internet, so I don't do that. And I know there's people that look at me like, well, you don't have it that bad. So I'm just going to use an example from today at work. So most people know what a stroke is, but they don't know what foot drop is. They don't know what aphasia is. They don't know what apraxia is. They don't know what anomia is. They don't know what Paul's gaze, gaze, gaze palsy is. They don't know, you know, what some of the vascular dementia or or they don't know what vascular cognitive impairment is, or, or sensory overload, sensory flooding, sensory sensitivity, sen uh, sensory defensiveness. And they, they have post-stroke anxiety, post-stroke fatigue. They have no idea what these things are because they're concepts they're never going to have to deal with in their current worldview because they haven't had a stroke yet. Some people that have family members at work, or sorry, some people at work have family members that have had stroke. So they sort of get it, and they ask me questions, and I try to be open with them about my experience and um, and I tell them, hey, I've got a YouTube channel. You might find some content there that's helpful. So today at work, I'm on a phone call. I do tech support for a living for a major telecommunications company here in Canada. And during the course of the call, my aphasia and my anomia started to present. So I had to start to tap during the call to regulate my speech. Right? And for those of us that have the aphasia, we know what that's like. So I had to tap to regulate my speech. And people were looking at me like, what are you doing? That looks stupid. And as soon as the call was over and we had a lull between calls, I was able to explain to people that's something I have to do from time to time. Because by far and large, most people have, I'll be honest, they've forgotten I've had a stroke. Or they don't think about it because I've been at work for six months um, I show up to work. I try not to let my bad days get in my way. There's been a couple days where I've had to leave work early because I'm having just a complete shit day. That's happened. Um, but I try not to dwell on the bad days. So on your average day at work, I know my gait and the way I walk changes at work. Um, I know I, I get sensitive to sound at work, but these are issues specifically related sort of to that environment. So at work, you might be a bit more conscious or you might be more noticeable that I've had a stroke. But then again, if I'm having a pretty good day and I got my groove on, it's, it's not really that present. I do notice that as the day progresses, I get a bit more tired and some of the verbal stuff, the, you know, my praxia, anomia, not so much the apraxia, more the anomia and the um, aphasia show up. So, uh, I do notice that. I know some people, my memory still sucks at work. There's a whole bunch of people that they walk up to me. I'm like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, I have no fucking clue who you are, but I'll just smile and nod. There's been a couple of people that have called me by name, and I'm like, hey, I, I'm going to be honest, don't remember your name. I don't know who you are. I know you work here. I know we've probably had conversations in the past, but I'm just going to be honest, I don't know who you are. And that's more a byproduct I haven't interacted with you probably in six or seven months. So there's been no reason for me to interact with you. So I've never had to recall your name. Because one of the major changes I had to make to go back to work was I quit smoking. So that I no longer have that sort of click of people that you gaggle with in the smoking area on breaks and lunches. I don't do that anymore. I have not been in the smoking area since I've returned to work. Because it's not one of my behaviors anymore. And I'm doing everything I can to dissociate myself from some of the behaviors I need to as to maximize my success potential. So, for those of you out there that want to be judgmental and discriminatory and just a douche, and, and you feel the need to point out to someone that their stroke wasn't real because they're not in a wheelchair they don't have a cane, they don't have a walker, they don't need crutches, you know, you can walk fairly normally, you can speak fairly normally, you know, you don't have all those typical kind of stroke symptoms, like stroke signs, that, you know, well, you're 30, how could if you had a stroke? It's not a real stroke. Yeah, because you're right. Only about 15% of all strokes in Canada 
are people under 50. So, you're right. Did I have the real stroke in the sense of the conventional stroke? Old people shit? No, I had a real stroke in the fact that my brain tried to kill me. The fun fact is, most brains trying to kill you happens to old people. So, for those of us that have had a, a stroke, for those of us that have ended up with fairly successful recovery results, with a rehabilitation team that's been highly effective, with, you know, the initial recovery intervention at the hospital level was superb, right? Where your reintegration is in back into your world is going swimmingly well, and you're trying to stay positive about your reinterpretation of your old life to your new life, yeah, it looks effortless some days. It, it completely does. It will almost look like I've never had a stroke. Because you know what? That's kind of my goal some days, to make it look like I've never had a stroke. Sad thing is, the more successful I am at getting back to where I was, some cases can be a bit of a downfall. Because then you're going to start being accusatory and saying, well, your stroke wasn't real. Well, for you, the douche canoes out there, or the twat waffles, that want to make the inference that my stroke wasn't real, yeah, I'll just start to ignore you. For those of you that want to be difficult with your loved ones that are going through their stroke recovery, please, before you open your mouth, think. Is what I'm about to say possibly going to end the relationship I have with the person I'm talking to. Because you know what? If you were trying to accuse me of not having a real stroke, you wouldn't like the outcome. Because I'd really show you what not having a real stroke looks like by just cutting you out of my life. It'd be about that simple. So, for those of you that have been watching the channel and you've been enjoying what you're watching for Coming up uh, 12 months and about three and a half, four weeks. Please, like, share, subscribe. If you know someone going through their own post-stroke journey or someone supporting someone going through the, their post-stroke journey, please point the channel out to them. <clears throat> Excuse me, they might get some benefit of some of the content I cover. And if you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs or symptoms of a stroke, that being someone appears to be befuddled, confused, or has an immediate lack of balance, Someone who has vision problems, they can't move their eyes in one direction, they see at a gray scale, they only see a little dot in the world. You know, someone who has a facial droop, there's a, a noticeable slacking of the facial muscles. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who can't smile equally effectively at all. Someone who's slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context. Please, or someone also who can't stand unaided uh, or has um, uh, difficult, difficulty maintaining their own body weight. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.